Hello and welcome to the fourth in a series of interviews and conversations with some of Israel's leading translators in the ongoing series co-hosted by the National Library of Israel and the Tel Aviv Bureau of Books, The Art of Translation. As I've ever said, I'm Akhna Jaim and I'm the co-editor of the Tel Aviv Bureau of Books and across the five weeks of August, I'll have the privilege of speaking with some of Israel's leading translators about their work and about their relationship with the Hebrew language. This evening, evening in Israel time, and welcome to wherever you are anywhere around the world, it's an absolute pleasure to be joined by Professor Yehuda Shenhav Sharabani. A distinguished academic, Professor Shenhav is Emeritus Professor of Sociology at Tel Aviv University. He is also the editor in chief of the Maktoub series for translation from Arabic, which is published by Van Leer Institute in Jerusalem. Founded by Professor Shenhav and the late Palestinian author Salman Nakhoub, Maktoub is the only project in the world dedicated to translating Arabic literature into Hebrew. Professor Shenhav himself has translated a number of works in Arabic into Hebrew including books by Salman Lotu and Elias Khouri. Yehuda, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Akin. It's a pleasure. Lovely. Thank you. So um, I'm going to start off by yeah. talking about Maktoub. Um, first of all, thinking about the context in which it operates. Israel is situated in the middle of the Arab-speaking world. Um, approximately 20% of our population are native Arab speakers. And beyond that, I believe crucially, a large segment of the conscious population derive at least a part of their cultural heritage from the Arab world. Taking all that into account, it is interesting that um, Maktoub is the only project of the world dedicated to translation of Arabic literature into Hebrew. I wondered if you could tell us this evening a little bit about how the project came about. Uh, you mentioned a few uh, comments about the context. I would like to enlarge or uh, talk a bit more about the context because it uh, provides uh, a better understanding of the uh, initiative of uh, Maktoub at that uh, uh, time. The, the very sad uh, or grim situation of the Arabic language within the Israeli public sphere is well known. You mentioned uh, that Arabic was the heritage language, was the language of at least 50% of the Jewish population, let alone the Palestinians and the Arabs who live in Israel. So once upon a time, 70 years ago, the majority of the uh, of the population in Israel, Palestine, uh, whatever you want to call it, were Arab speakers. And uh, when uh, the majority uh, of the Arab speaking uh, Jews immigrated to Israel, they were uh, on the front line of the uh, Arabic language uh, across the board because the Arabic language is not one language. It, uh, if you think about the matrix, which has uh, different dialects, and different levels from the uh, literary level through the television level up to the uh, spoken language. So you have a matrix uh, with uh, many languages that are called Arabic language. Anyway, uh, during the last 70 years, the uh, command of Arabic language diminished dramatically in the Israeli scene among Jews and to some extent among Arabs as well. Uh, today, we conducted a, a survey to know how many of the Jews who live in Israel today can uh, function, perform, uh, speak, understand the Arabic language. And the uh, results were very grim, surprising and not surprising at the same time. Only 0.4% of the Jews, the Israeli Jews who live today in Israel can read text in Arabic, which is, you know, sociologically is uh, as close to zero. Yes, yes. And this is, I mean, this is unbearable. I mean, this is, this is, you know, it's, it's very, it's very hard to, under, to explain 
uh, this uh, rate of illiteracy. Mm -hmm. uh, Israeli Jews are illiterate in Arabic language, despite the fact that they live among uh, or surrounded by 200,000 uh, million uh, uh, Arab speakers in the world. And that Arabic was the lingua franca of the region, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, let alone that it is the language of the region, the language of the people who live there. And when we started Maktoub, and you mentioned the late uh, Salman Natu, who was a friend of mine, he, uh, he died three years ago, three and a half years ago. We contemplated together the idea that um, instead of translating literature, uh, in the way uh, the canonical model of translation works. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about it later on if you want. Is the, model, the, the, the modern model of translation, which is based on individual translation, on individuals who sit uh, in their offices, in their studies with, uh, you know, there was uh, dictionaries, with uh, idiomatic uh, books, uh, with books about the period, whatever you need to sit and translate. But the, the modern model, the Western modern model of translation is based on individual translations. All the literature addresses individuals as translators. And we thought that the idea of individual translation might be a good idea in other cases, but where there is a rife where is a strife, where is a conflict between languages, uh, let alone uh, uh, where uh, language is being erased from the public sphere, it doesn't make sense that Palestinians and Arabs would be out of the question, would be out of the uh, translation cycle. Mm -hmm. Because most of the translators from, he from Arabic to Hebrew was, were obviously Jews because they felt uh, comfortable in their, uh, the, 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 the target language is the mother tongue of the translator. Okay. And we uh, thought that this, in this particular case, when translation is being conducted in a conflict zone, mm -hmm. and particularly in the, this context of the uh, arabic Hebrew relationship, that translation should be a joint work of Arabs and Jews together. So all of our, our translations in Maktoub are joint translation of Jews and Arabs who work together. I see. And you want to continue or you want to ask? Please something? continue. I have questions, but please continue. Yes. So because it's a long story. Uh, <laughs> part of what we're here for. Please continue. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so, uh, because the, 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 we don't perceive translation as a notary copy mm. uh, that, uh, you know, the translation is uh, uh, loyal to the source and all this kind of uh, discourse. We want to circumvent this discourse. And we think that the, uh, uh, the, uh, the idea of bringing back translation into the dialogue or the function, the function of the dialogue mm -hmm. is a major thing. Because since the, the beginning of the, of the modern era, since the Renaissance, I would say in Europe, uh, uh, translation was disconnected from the function of a dialogue. And translation was to begin with uh, 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 an instrument for a dialogue between people. Right. The dialogue in one way or another, it has have to be direct dialogue, indirect dialogue, but where is the dialogue? So when we sit together, Jews and Arabs, in the, in the translation room, and discuss uh, a literary text in Arabic and in Hebrew, we actually bring back a, a, a dialogue into that uh, craft. That's quite fascinating. So talking about this dialogue, could you perhaps describe a little more, bit more in detail the actual working model of the Maktoub series, basically, in terms of how does the dialogue work in practice? Well, it's, I think it's, uh, it's tailor-made. 
there is no uh, assembly line here. Uh -huh. By tailor-made, I mean that each project has its own necessities. Right. Uh, sometimes it's a, it's a play, and there is a play, we see it, uh, two Jews and two Arabs, the four of us, we read the, 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 the text in Arabic, and we redo it in Hebrew in a, in, a, in, a, in a dialogue, back and forth. And it doesn't have to be identical to the source, to the original, but it has to, you know, it has to, 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 to be alive. It has to be, to, to function as an alive text. Because one of the things that I didn't uh, say much about the modern model of the individual model, mm -hmm. but, but since the beginning of the Renaissance, the, uh, uh, the, 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 I would say the canonical uh, model of translation was based on the Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity, Trinity. Mm -hmm. of one translator, mm -hmm. one language, and one mm -hmm. Okay. And these three uh, strings attached to the translation uh, process uh, make it very much uh, sterile, but it doesn't have the uh, traces of the conflict. It doesn't have the traces of the uh, the thing that we call the 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 the, 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 the things that are un untranslatable. Uh -huh. uh, it doesn't have the um, uh, I would say the the the, uh, the traces of the of the conflict between the languages. Right. We. Uh, 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 prefer to retain those conflicts, to to uh, to have a protocol of those conflicts, to understand where we stand. A dialogue is not necessarily uh, based on consensus, and and we are not trying to iron the the text uh, to be completely in Hebrew without traces of the Arabic language as the. As the uh, you would say that some of the translation models uh, dictate or offer us, uh, for example, the idea of the transparent uh, translation. Okay. That's really interesting, isn't it? Because I read something you wrote where you discussed the possibility, the question of, say, for example, including footnotes with a translation, and your interlocutor said, "Of course not. This is a story. It's not a history." I'm very, very interested in how one negotiates the fact that whilst there is a social and a political purpose behind your work, at the same time, you're preserving its, its aesthetic and its cultural um, significance at the same time. How do you negotiate this? That's very good. First of all, we don't separate aesthetic from political, from the political. As you well know, they are all uh, conflated in one. Uh, thing. So when we think about aesthetic, we do think about aesthetic, we do think about language, we do think about literature, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, we are aware of the fact that we are acting in the world itself. It's not only within literature, but we sit in the world and we negotiate in bilingually, well, in two languages, uh, uh, a situation that is very rare today. In Israel, How, where do you see uh, Jews and Arabs sit and, and discuss in two languages uh, uh, ideas about politics, about literature, about uh, you know, uh, about the past, about the present, about the future, all those kind. Of things. But uh, 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 but but in the model of one one uh, one version, one language, we miss uh, a lot of the opportunities to uh, connection, for the connection between the languages. Okay. It, it, translation is not a mirror image in one language of the, uh, of the original language, mm -hmm. but rather uh, we try to clone. Sometimes you can clone two languages and let them meet in a surprising uh, uh, kind of, uh, of junctures. Right. So, so uh, the idea is to sit in the, in the translation room and negotiate. Mm -hmm. As in, in, in Hegelian work, to negotiate. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the third is there uh, for us, waiting for us. The, uh -huh. third, the third, metaphorically, I mean. Yes, I understand. Yes, and, and, and the third emerges out of that process. Mm 
Right. Sometimes, and sometimes, and I'll give you uh, uh, an indication, sometimes we change the original based on the translation work. Now, uh, you, uh, I mentioned, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, that, uh, I, you know, I wrote about footnotes. Oh, footnotes, yes, I did. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, I translated a novel by the, uh, you know, the uh, well-known uh, Lebanese uh, writer, Idias Khouri. Uh, I happened to, to, to translate five or six uh, novels of him and, uh, uh, to be honest, I'm mesmerized by his uh, writing. He's a very well writing, and I hope that he will get the Nobel. And sometimes I'll be a famous person because he will get the Nobel, and I'll be his translator. <laughs> uh, and he uh, uh, writes about Adam, Adam, who uh, the protagonist. Adam is a Palestinian uh, youngster. His uh, age is 17 years old. And he's in love. He's in love with the daughter of the, the garage owner, Rivka. Rivka is Jewish. And he, uh, you know, he uh, speaks with her and uh, quotes a line from a well-known uh, Sufi uh, uh, Arabic uh, poet. Yes. And, and he says, Lam yuzidni al-wirdu illa atasham. This is in Arabic. Yes. And then he says uh, that he uh, kind of uh, tried to uh, translate the line to Rivka and he wasn't able to find the right words in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So he did not translate the line to Rivka. Yes. So now, what do I do? I, how do I convey? Of course, there is a upper hand for the Arabic, the readers in the Arabic, because they know what the line means. Yeah. And the, uh, by the way, he plays here, Idias Khouri plays with major languages, minor languages. At time he puts at the Arabic to be major and, Ar and Hebrew to be minor, and at times, place, of course. Mm -hmm. And and I tell, tell, tell myself that if, if uh, Adam did not, or was not able to translate this line to Rivka, there's no need for the readers to know what it means. So they are in the dark as Rivka is. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I translate, literate, I write Lam Yuzidni, whatever the Arabic line in uh, Hebrew letters, but without translating it. And if I am courageous enough and I mimic Ilyas Khouri playfulness because he's very playful with his literature. Uh -huh. So I allow myself to be playful myself and write in the text, not in the footnote, that the translator of this novel decided following Adam not to translate this line to the Hebrew readers. That's a very interesting intervention. So of course, I told him he laughed and uh, he liked it because he does that all the time. You can read Elias Khouri. Elias Khouri does those interventions uh, that remind us that there is a writer behind the text. So each time you find yourself uh, fall under the spell of this literature, he would tell you something that remind you that there is a sovereign uh, hand behind it. I so, quite. so he can uh, describe uh, an event in a bar in Beirut, and he said, all of, the all of a sudden, uh, Rima entered the bar. By the way, Rima is the only character in this novel that doesn't live in Alhamra Street. Mm -hmm. Where does this come from? What the heck? So he plays with you and uh, tells you, when you are trying to uh, sink into the story, and you forget there is somebody who runs the show, I'm here. I just declare that I'm here. And I, I do the same, not out of narcissistic reason, but because as you said earlier, politics demands that I come clean, that I say, hey, I'm a translator. Here are my uh, basic uh, assumptions. Here's how I work. This is what I do with Arabic, or Palestinians' old names? Do I write them in their older version? Do I uh, 
uh, put them in the Hebrew version. I have all sort of commitments because it's a political work. Which is quite interesting because there's an element of not subverting authorial intent, but asserting some sort of position of yourself as a translator, which perhaps is not always evident in the act of translation. On that point, before I continue, just to remind members of the audience that um, we'd be delighted if you've got any questions that you'd like to ask Professor Shen Hanf. If you stick with me with chat facility, I will try to get to as many of them as possible before the end of the evening. Um, Maktoub publishes four books a year. Um, what, and it's, I believe, a selection, a mixture of classic and contemporary um, literature. What informs the selection process? And maybe this is a bit of a delicate question, but in a sense, you're placing yourselves as gatekeepers. How do you police yourselves to make sure that what you choose is representative of your wider intent? Uh, there is a big gap between our wider intent and uh, our uh, ambition and the situation on the ground. And it's not uh, like a supermarket that we go through the shelves and we pick and choose. Uh, it doesn't work like this because as you well know, there is a BDS on Israel, on Israeli uh, cultural uh, scene. And it's not always easy to uh, get permission from writers, uh, particularly if they are being attacked in the Arab world, rightly, rightly so. Um, uh, and uh, we have to be very careful, sensitive, and do a delicate work in selecting. That's why the, the word selection is not very appropriate because we don't only select. Um, the, uh, we proved uh, ourselves in the last four or five years that actually the work that we are doing is not the standard work of um, uh, orientalizing the, uh, li the literature that we're translating as was the case uh, uh, before, not all, all, all no, you know, not all. In, I, I would say, I, I wouldn't include the Andalus and Mifras, there are two publishers. Uh, they cool. did excellent work in publishing uh, uh, Arabic literature, but, uh, it, it, you know, it, by and large, people in the past would not get permission because the, the argument goes that uh, basically Arab countries are enemy countries and there's no legal relationship and uh, we want to uh, translate and there's no way we can get permission, etc., etc., etc. People were publishing without permission uh, from the authors. Uh, once upon a time, Ibrahim Nasrallah, who is a Palestinian writer said, so what, you are raping us again? You raped us, you took our land, you took our houses, you took this, now you're taking our literature and language. And rightly so, he was very angry when he found out that he was translated without permission. So first of all, we get permission from authors. We don't do I think without this permission, I myself have two books in the drawer that I never published because I never got permission from the authors, oh. uh, from the dead authors, um, uh, I should say. Okay. Uh, and I couldn't get the permission from their family, etc., etc., etc. But we have good reputation uh, in terms of uh, uh, doing uh, some kind of political work and translation is a, a, a way of resisting, resisting the conventions that were uh, uh, accepted in the Israeli cultural scene regarding translations of Arabic to Hebrew. For example, if you read about uh, Nasrallah in Lebanon, yes. and the, all, the, all the Hebrew uh, newspaper write Nasrallah with S, which has to be with Sa and not Sa, and this is, uh, 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 you do, they do it for the phonetic reason, for the Jewish ear, and not for other reasons. So this uh, um, convention, uh, it, it, you know, is not being acceptable by us. We changed all the convention regarding translation, and we, we see translation as resistance. 
And uh, Ilyas Khouri and other uh, uh, writers that were translated by Maktoub said, yes, we want to be heard in Hebrew. We support the BDS, but we want to be heard and read in Hebrew the way Maktoub does the, the translation. Right. And, 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 and the, uh, so this is a long answer to your question about selection. We don't always select. But we try to have a variety. So we have uh, four Iraqi novels. Mm-hmm. One of them uh, is by a Jew who wrote in Arabic, Samir Naqash. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have eight Palestinian novels. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, do you want to guess how many Palestinian novels were translated from Arabic to Hebrew ever? Less I would, than... I the guess, but I'm guessing very few. What? I wouldn't want to hazard a guess because I'll make a fool of myself, but I'm guessing very few. No, no, very few. Uh, 24. Oh, okay, that's not very much at all. <laughs> much less than I thought. Mm-hmm. 1870. Uh, I, uh, one third of them were translated by Maktoub in the last four years. I mean, this is very grim. Situation is very bad. And, and I think that uh, if you look at translation overall, 65% of the translation from foreign languages to Hebrew are from English. Mm-hmm. Only 1% are books for, that are translated from the Arab world. Uh, the I- Israeli Jews have no interest in, the, in what's happening in the Arab world. And... I'm just going to cut across for a moment. It's interesting because I was going to speak about this later on, which is about the context of life in Israel at the moment. And the fact that, and you might be able to talk about this in a moment and I ask you about your relationship with language, which is that your generation of first and second generation migrants from the Arab world did not have a space to use Arabic. And this is, I wonder, I'm asking, does this have an impact on how people listen to stories in Arabic, listen to stories from the Arab world, or encourage people to tell their stories in Arabic? It's, it's a complicated thing. So, take, 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 I'll, I'll give you an example from my own biography. Yes. I... Uh, was born in 1952. Uh, my parents, when they uh, raised me, both of them spoke Arabic. They didn't know Hebrew. So I can tell you that Arabic is my mother tongue. Aha. Uh-huh. Because, you know, by definition. Yes, it is your mother's tongue. Yes. Yes. And then I uh, went to Hebrew school, Hebrew kindergarten, Hebrew school, and I uh, accomplished a uh, good standard of Hebrew and it surmounted my Arabic. Mm-hmm. So what happened to my uh, mother tongue? My first language, I'm using here a distinction that Edward Said has used between mother tongue and first language. And uh, uh, the, the, the idea, the idea of a mother tongue is, or the, the definition of a mother tongue is that you, uh, 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 that you study your mother tongue without the mediation of other languages. But what, what happened if you, like in my case, I study Arabic, which I study late in life, uh, uh, via my first language? Yes. Does that still remain to be defined as a mother tongue or something else? Once upon a time, I decided, when I decided to uh, study Arabic uh, seriously, I can tell you more about that later on, but uh, it was, I was in my Mm forties. And uh, I bought from Amazon uh, uh, software to study Arabic. And it was all in Arabic. It was like, you know, Pac-Man. You you had this, this is, uh, apparently that was how, the um, uh, CIA agent was studying Arabic, apparently. I don't know if this is true. And there was no mediation of other language. And they said, if you want to study a language, 
as in, in, as a matter of fact, you do, you, you do not have mediation of other languages. So, mm -hmm. so, but here, you see that the definition of a mother tongue is being redefined because there are the, the, the bulks of, of, of uh, generation of immigrants yeah. where they, they study the first language and they teach their parents this first language that they weren't uh, 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 able to acquire themselves. Uh, uh, acquire themselves. So uh, uh, if you look today in generation in Israel, you see, for example, my mother. My mother is 90 years old. She uh, speaks Arabic, very good Arabic, although, although we, she, she, you know, she speaks also some Hebrew. But uh, I, at her generation, only 26% of the people of her generation still speak Arabic. Oh. If you go down at my, in my generation, uh, it's, it goes down from 26% to 6 7%. Yes. And if you go down uh, another generation to my daughter's generation, it's uh, null, it's uh, zero. So you see that there is here uh, the, the process of de Arabization mm -hmm. was very strong. And even today, when you go and uh, I want to speak Arabic with Palestinians, uh, they want to show you that they know Hebrew better than you know Arabic. So Hebrew becomes a dominant language. And this is uh, uh, very characteristic of every colonial situation. In the Andalus period, uh, uh, in Cordoba, in Toledo, whatever, all Jews in, uh, during the, the Middle Ages, all, all Jews spoke Arabic and wrote in Arabic. The big, uh, you know, Arab empire was in charge uh, back then. So we see how language is being twisted by colonial situation. I'm going to go back slightly, and you mentioned the Orientalist presumptions that often come in translation. And something that you've talked about at length before, which is the neoclassical approach to translation. I wonder if you could elucidate a little bit more about that, to give us a sense of what you mean by the neoclassical approach to, to translation and why in our specific political context, it's maybe more of a problem than elsewhere. Okay. First of all, Orientalism. You would uh, easily find the translators in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s in the uh, 20th century that uh, employ Orientalist assumption about translation. For example, Kapeliuk, a very well-known uh, translator, takes a, a Tahsen, a, a, a novel, which is called The Days, El Ayam, and twists it, it changes it from a, a third voice to a first voice. Uh -huh. He says, you know, it's an autobiography, it has to be in a first voice. So he changes the entire novel based on his Orientalist assumption that all autobiographies has to be in first voice, which was, I mean, all the beauty of that, uh, of that novel is that it's written in a third voice. Uh, so this is an example, or oh, the same uh, translator would write, uh, since uh, the, this the literature that I'm translating uh, uh, from, uh, I would say, from Egyptian literature has not, has not reached a stage of uh, uh, a good literature, therefore I allowed myself to, you know, uh, shirk or cut of uh, discussion or conversation were, that were excessive, those kind of things, that those kind of comments, which are Orientalist and they wouldn't dare doing when they translate from English or, or French, etc. Also, also, the, 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 the MACTU project has, as I said earlier, has two pillars. One pillar is the political that we, we discussed, why we do it, but the theoretical, in changing the, the, the idea of what translation is all about. And I mentioned the neoclassical, you mentioned the neoclassical. Uh, it's called neoclassical because it emerged in the Renaissance, the neoclassical period. 
And uh, the, the period where was where the vernacular languages, the spoken languages emerged, first emerged and distanced themselves from Latin, which was the, the, the language that all uh, people spoke in the Roman Empire. So you would find the new German, the new English, the new French, the new Spanish, the new etc. Those are the seeds or the antecedents or the precursors of the national languages. Uh -huh. So you cannot imagine nationalism without those precursors that are in essence uh, based on translation, translation of the Bible. So Luther translated the Bible uh, uh, into, Germ uh, into uh, spoken Germany to be uh, to, 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 to spread it among the populace uh, because the spoken language was more important than the source. Right. So he betrays the Jewish sources. The King James translates uh, to English, etc., etc., etc. So translation was a machinery. To develop the, the vernacular languages. Mm -hmm. And this was the proto languages of the national uh, languages to come in the 19th century. Right. So the neoclassical was basically ba based, if you imagine uh, Toledo or, or Cordova yes. in the Middle Ages, uh, I would say the, the, the 11th, 12th, 13th centuries. So called Golden Age, yes. Mm -hmm. Golden Age, and you would uh, you would think about translator who did together, two or three people work together on a text or work together on um, transforming a message or transmitting a message, and they try to decipher together the essence of that thing. This whole thing was now uh, 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 individualized into one person who sit in their offices, as I said before, and work without that dialogue with other people. And that was partly the habitus of the nation that dictates that, that, see what I'm saying? Yes, the act of transition actually reflects broader political presumptions and broader political processes, okay. which are necessarily um, conducive for communal or communal relationships, basically, yeah. Right. Conducive, right. Conducive to communal relationships, some kind of another. Yeah. Right. right. Okay. That's really interesting. But, um, uh, so if, if I go back, I mean, it's like this discussion is going back and forth too fast. Uh, I'm sorry. Right. But no, 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 no. Uh, that's the nature of those kind of things. Uh, the, uh, the, the literature that we translate, we just uh, published a uh, 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 novel of uh, exchange, letter exchange between the two, two poets, uh, Mahmoud Darwish and Samih Al Qasim. Uh -huh. The letters, El Rasail, we just published it. Uh, we published uh, uh, just now a novel about Akka, Akko, Akka uh, in the 40s by Yad Barghouti from the Maktoub team. Uh, we, pub we published a very successful. Uh, 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 book for children. It's called uh, the, uh, the, the Kids Are Laughing by a Syrian uh, writer, Zakaria Tamer. Yes. Uh, uh, we try to have two, three novels of the Ashuri, of course. We try to have a variety uh, and always have uh, 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 some kind of proportion between uh, prose and poetry. We have poetry as well and uh, some memoirs as well. Uh, I think the, the flagship of our uh, project is a, a book, a collection of short stories called Amputated Tongue. Right, right. Which, uh, which is the biggest anthology ever in uh, Palestinian uh, uh, short stories in any language. And uh, there are discussion now in, in, in publishing that, translating and publishing that in Arabic. Oh, right. Yeah. Even in Arabic, you don't find such an anthology uh, where a hundred people participate in that project, and each pro uh, story was uh, was a uh, you know was uh, uh, two or three, four people worked on them uh, uh, simultaneously, back and forth, 
And all this uh, process of uh, dialogue and democratization uh, makes the process more cumbersome. Uh, but nevertheless, you know what I mean, because it involves a lot of people. But nevertheless, it's more democratic, more political, and more uh, sensitive to the sources. Right, and one assumes that the outcome reflects the amount of work that's been put into negotiating it. Um, and it's actually quite interesting because um, I think that Maktoubi is quite unique in where possible, for reasons that you've discussed already amongst others, in working with the authors of original texts in terms of not merely getting their permission, which is terribly important, but also in terms of negotiating the mean and negotiating the intentions in their original text. And I want to talk a little bit about your relationship with Elias Khoury, which I believe you have beyond the fact that you've translated several of his books, you do have a personal relationship as well, which started off in rather interesting fashion. Um, I think you translated his book, but you then had to seek permission to publish it. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that. I know of Elias Khoury. Uh, I read uh, two novels of him uh, in Hebrew, uh, Babi Shams, of course, the uh, uh, Diallo. And uh, when I uh, studied the Arabic uh, afresh, although I grew up in a, in a family where uh, Arabic was the uh, sovereign language at home, so to speak, uh, it was an Iraqi dialect, a Jewish Iraqi dialect, and I couldn't read and I couldn't uh, speak the literary standard uh, uh, language. Uh, when I went to, to uh, started to study, which is another event, uh, which is in, uh, kind of uh, symbolic because uh, it was after my father passed away uh, in the Gulf War, uh, he died when an Iraqi missile hit his neighborhood. Oh. Uh, um, and this is very symbolic how an Iraqi missile uh, chased my Iraqi father. And that uh, introduced me, uh, was the point of departure where I started to uh, uh, think about studying Arabic seriously, actually to know uh, the language that my father spoke and I did not uh, speak. And um, I went and, and studied in a high school in Nazareth and uh, I went to a private uh, teacher in Jaffa, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, saying all this, I must admit that I forgot your question. What was the question? The question is that I'm interested in how you build a relationship with Elias Khoury. Right. So so, so I went to London and I went to the uh, Saki uh, bookstore, which is a well-known uh, bookstore. Westbourne Park in West London, yes. In Westbourne Park in West London, yes. Right. And uh, I uh, bought a book called, in Arabic called uh, Wujul Baida, White Faces. And I uh, read it on the plane and I was so mesmerized and I started to translate it in the in the play with a with a pencil on the book and when i got back to tel aviv uh i translated uh the whole book i pr promise you it was like four weeks four mad weeks then i realized that elias khuri wrote this book in three weeks anyway <laughs> the book was banned by arafat because it was very critical of the palestinians uh organization in Lebanon, but that's a different story altogether. And I finished uh, 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 translating the book, and now what? What do I do? How do I publish? Uh, I wasn't even aware to all this. I was, it was like out of zeal, out of, uh, you know, out of uh, passion. So I asked my friend, uh, Rai Frezrek, who is, was in, uh, in relationship with uh, Elias Khoury, and he told Elias Khoury that I public, uh, translated the book. And he, if he agrees to, uh, that the book will be published in Hebrew, so he didn't uh, give the permission, but he wrote a line, I won't sue him. Okay, that's something. <laughs> that's something. That's, uh, and by the way, that among the agreements, uh, that we don't always get copyrights from writers. We get different kind of uh, responses. I won't sue you. Um, I, you know, I'll be happy, but, you know, all kind of uh, 
responses not always have a signed contract. Right, yes. Mm -hmm. And that's part of uh, the result of the delicacy of the situation, of course. And uh, I, he gave me this permission, I won't sue you. Oh, I won't sue him. It wasn't uh, directed to me at all. Then I uh, traveled to New York. He was teaching there at NYU. Yes. Uh, and I traveled to New York. We met. He gave me another novel of him and uh, uh, the travel of little Gandhi. And then uh, anyway, we developed our relationship and we uh, met or meet regularly twice a week, uh, twice a year in Europe. And we speak, and we speak on the telephone regularly, and uh, and uh, and the and and I wrote a book that was just published. Uh, that is the account of the relationship of a translator with a writer, and uh, how uh, this kind of dialogue shapes the way translation is being done and shapes the idea of what translation is all about. Right. right. And, and, and one last comment, if I may, <clears throat> uh, that uh, we, I said that this is a political project, Maktoub and all this. Uh, so for example, the inauguration of the, of the book, for example, the novel, uh, Children of the Ghetto, which is about the, the ghetto in, L in Lid, a Lid, Lod, Lydia, uh, was in the ghetto itself with Elias Khoury on the screen from Beirut with the descendants of the ghetto survivors. So we, what I mean to say is that we have those events in the world yes. that exceeds, uh, I would say, the boundaries of literature per se. Mm -hmm. Quite, indeed. Thank you very much. This is a fascinating conversation. We've got quite a few questions in the chat facility and we don't have very much time left. So I'm going to start to run through them now. Um, some interesting comments as well. Judith Appleton observes that one reason why there isn't Arabic in the wider sphere is because it's not taught or not required in Israeli schools from grade on onwards, which is quite interesting. Marcia Saltz asks how many Israelis can speak Arabic? We've talked about that already to some degree. Toby often asks, how do you think the emergence of English as a second language in Israel and the Middle East has affected the use of Arabic? Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts about that, about English? Yeah, uh, uh, first of all, uh, why Arabic is not being taught uh, the first question, not being taught properly in Israel, I would recommend a book, very fascinating book by a colleague of mine in Maktoub to uh, Dr. Jonathan Mendel, who wrote uh, a book that called The Creation of Israeli Arabic. And there he discusses uh, all the pitfalls of the uh, uh, Arabic education in Israel, the way, you know, I have a friend who is teaching uh, Arabic in a high school in Tel Aviv. And uh, all of a sudden uh, he hears uh, somebody knocks on the door and he opens the door. Uh, at the doorstep, there is the headmaster. And the headmaster tells him that he had heard from parents through uh, WhatsApp, through the kids that write, the parents that he speaks Arabic in class and he asks him to speak Hebrew in class, even though the class is in Arabic. So there's all this kind of stereotypes, uh, uh, problems, uh, you know, the most people, most uh, students, pupils that uh, study Arabic do it uh, for the sake of using it in the army, in the military, in the intelligence, and uh, 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 not, uh, not, not as a spoken language, uh, uh, a live, vivid spoken language. So you, you it's, it's it, it, in essence, what uh, Jonathan Mendel argues is that Arabic became like Latin, Latin in the old days. It's a language that you hear in the intelligence or you read if you're a researcher or whatever, but you never speak. Okay, engage. Right. You don't engage with other people in that language. Uh -huh. uh, uh, somebody asked how many people can speak Arabic. Depends. It depends how 
uh, how you define speaking uh, terms, uh, the, uh, I would say that it's less than uh, nine, uh, eight percent at most, and this is uh, an overestimation. So, uh, point, point, point four percent can read less than half percent, and I would say six, seven, eight percent at most can speak to some extent Arabic, which is very lean. Uh, about the English, yes, of course, uh, English is perceived as the major language of the region and the world uh, uh, writ large. And by the way, it, 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 it affects the in, uh, Arab speaking, native Arab speaking uh, speakers as well. You'd find, for example, in Instagram, a lot of Instagram, what you call Twitters and all this, you'd find a mix of Arabic and English. And this is something that, uh, you know, that's being probably is a determ determ determined, we are determined to be influenced by that. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, Lisa Wishman, asks, and I think we've touched on this to some degree already, but how do you decide what to translate? Now, you've translated Salman Natu, you've translated Elias Khoury, I'm um, not quite sure who else, I think it's someone else, but I don't remember off the top of my head. How I, do you, 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 you mean my, myself uh, personally? Myself personally. I translated uh, a, a Yemenite uh, writer, uh, Ali al-Makri, uh, the handsome Jew, which is uh, sp uh, which is about the the, the 17th century uh, Yemen uh, Jews in Yemen in 17th century. Um, uh, I translated now a, a, a Samuel Shimon Iraqi in Paris, uh, who is uh, a Assyrian Iraqi Assyrian, who is the editor of Banipal. The only, the only uh, periodical of Arab literature, modern Arab literature in English in London. He and his wife, Margaret Obank, publish a wonderful, a wonderful periodical. Uh, and I uh, translated his, uh, his novel, uh, Iraqi in Paris, where he uh, traces his uh, uh, story as a, as a homeless person in, in Paris in the 80s and 90s. Uh, Mahmoud Shker, who is a Palestinian writer who lives in East Jerusalem. I just, this week, uh, a book uh, that uh, of uh, short stories uh, that I translated was published. And, but I, you know, I, um, uh, I think that uh, when you write, find a writer, that you feel connected with and it feels right, then you are uh, open to uh, experiment with all sort of experimentation. For example, since I, I uh, translated six of Elias Khoury's novels, yes. I can allow myself to play with it. For example, in the last two uh, novels, I have not had, I've not read the whole novel before I started translating. And right. I translate as I go along which is another experience and another, uh, um, uh, it allows me to be on my toes during translation and uh, I, I feel that everything is uh, virgin, uh, excuse me for the words, that, that I haven't touched that yet. Uh, and, 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 and so I allow myself to experiment with the translation when I trust that uh, the writer that I'm translating has uh, um, secured hand, so to speak. He knows what he's doing. The writer who you're translating is taking you on the journey of discovery and you're happy to follow along and see where it leads you. Still call has asked two questions. One of them that's actually slightly related to what we've just talked about. The first question she asks is, if I can find it, how do you deal with texts that are openly offensive to Israel. And I suppose this depends on how you define offensive to Israel, but uh, I'll be interested in what you think. Uh, I agree with you, Akin. What, what do you, uh, let's ask what, what is offensive in there. Uh, person who asks the question, I didn't get the name. Gloria Stoko. Gloria, I'm not quite sure if you're still here, but if you want to say something a bit more about 
what you describe as offensive to Israel, because it's um, it could be interpreted in a number of ways. But the second question she asked, I'm just scrolling down to it, is that is there an equivalent effort of translation from Hebrew to Arabic in any Arab speaking countries? I actually know that there's a publishing house here in Israel. It's called, it starts with a K, I've forgotten its name, but it does translate Hebrew world to Arabic, but I'm more quite sure about the wider Arabic world. Uh, first of all, okay, offensive. If, uh, if a, a novel uh, described the uh, atrocities, of the Israeli army in 48 in Haifa, is this offensive to Israel? I don't think so. I just got what she said, what she means. She says, I mean a text that questions the existence of Israel. Still not uh, very clear to me. What does it mean, the question of the existence of Israel? I myself uh, think that, for example, that okay, let's not get into my my politics here. We won't have time to develop into that, but I have said, to be fair to you, I have said before. Yeah, you I think that we do a great service. We do a great service. Mm-hmm. Listen, I, I, I was born here in Israel. I was a patriot once upon a time, and I think I still am. Yeah. But I, you know, I don't, don't think that the, the lies, so to speak, that, uh, that we have been told about 48, about those kind of things, good, do good service to us. I think that if we hear uh, Israeli youngsters uh, know and hear and understand and study what happened here and what the history of this place looks like, we get into a better place and better relationship between Jews and Arabs here. So I, there's no such thing as offensive. If this is offensive, vulgar in terms of literature, so of course I won't deal with it. But if this is uh, something about the history, the joint history, which is not always being uh, open or disclosed, this is not offensive in my opinion. And yes, there is uh, translation the other way around too, from Hebrew to Arabic. Uh, uh, By the way, uh, Yad Barghouti, who is part of that, uh, of Maktoub, is doing, uh, has a publishing, a small publishing house called uh, Dar Laila, which does publication from Hebrew to Arabic. And by the way, we Maktoub is, uh, you know, there's a, this uh, book prize, the Sapir Prize here for the, uh, the one of the prizes is, is to translate the book to from Hebrew to Arabic, and Maktoub is doing it. So we're doing the other way around too. Also, members of your audience want to wear the Sapir Prize is Israel's premier prize for fiction, and it's awarded once a year to a book I judge to be the best book in Hebrew that year. And just a quick plug to say that next week we will actually be talking about the translation of a book that won the Sapir Prize, Esa Peded's, um, I forgot the title, I'm afraid. We'll come back to that in a moment. Okay, back to questions. Um, Olga Lempert asks, Hello, Olga, I hope you're well. Is there an issue of ownership and bias, i.e., would a translator from, say, Norway with learned Arabic be a good participant through Maktoub's process? Or would it be better that they are native speakers who, quote unquote, own the culture? What was the question, though? Is there a question of ownership and bias? So in the sense that would a translator from Norway, just as an example, with good Arabic, would that translator be welcome, be able to participate in the translator's forum in much the same way as a native owner of one of the languages in question? Could hey, hey, yes, we're an open society, of course. Uh, but it's a good question. It's a, it's a sensitive question because it touches upon the, the, the very basic of that uh, project. Because we, when we uh, translate together with Palestinian Arab speakers, um, my hidden agenda, our hidden agenda, they, that they can represent somebody who is not represented here. Uh-huh. Uh, for example, the absentees. Mm-hmm. Translate the absentees. How do you write literature of the absentees? How do you write refugeeness? Uh, the, 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 the experience of being a refugee out of place, out of context. So you need somebody who would represent you symbolically in that translation process. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't mean uh, to say that a Norwegian with good Arabic cannot participate, but the I, issues of identity are very important here in translation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Quite. That's really interesting. Um, let's just see. We're running out of time. Just going to see if ah, this is interesting. Judith Appleton asks. It's a statement actually. She says of the Milton Pot philosophy was what banished two languages of the parents of the fifties were told by doctors and teachers that speaking two languages would damage your first language, which is actually quite interesting. Um, I'm old enough, I suppose, to remember when being bilingual was seen as a potential negative and children were encouraged to learn only one language. Do you think that that might have had an impact on the Hebrew Arabic coexistence in the young state of Israel? Hey, it's a smart comment, and I agree with this comment. And because in, in, in Israeli society, once upon a time, and still is, if you uh, erase or diminish a second language, it's being perceived as an achievement. Uh, this is uh, strange. This is uh, bizarre. This is, uh, unbe uh, you know, unbelievable. Uh, but once upon a time, that was the ideology. Israel is a very monolinguistic society. And in that sense, the erasure of other languages was, a, was an achievement. But we shouldn't uh, uh, take it uh, uh, in the wrong way because Arabic, I mean, so the monolinguistic ideology profited that all you know, second languages should be erased because they belong to the diaspora. So there is the idea of negation of the diaspora. You know, mm -hmm. the new Jew who come to, to the new state and uh, there's a national state and has to uh, put the diaspora and the, and, the, and, the, and the qualification and the qualities of the diaspora behind them. This is true, but Arabic does not only belong to the diaspora, Arabic is a language of the place, of the land. So unlike Polish, uh, Yiddish, uh, whatever, that suffered also from erasure. But Arabic has a different status. Arabic is the language of the land. So I would make this distinction here. Right. I see. Fascinating. Um, I think we're going to call an end to proceedings now. It's slightly after nine o'clock and you've been incredibly generous with your time and with your insights and your stories about the work of the Mark II project and broadly speaking about um, translation from Arabic into Hebrew. Um, as ever, I would like to thank the audience for being very, very active and very, very engaged in the chat forum. I would like to thank Aviva Zeller, Zula, I beg your pardon, um, for her technical support this evening. As ever, I'd like to thank Olga Lempert for managing the process of National Library. And I'd like to thank Sam Thorpe, who is in charge of Middle East section at the National Library, for the wonderful suggestion to bring um, Professor Shen Hav to our forum this evening. And finally, Yehuda, I would like to thank you very much for being with us in a wonderful and fascinating conversation. Um, next week will be the last in the five um, series, the five episode series of the Art of Translation, and it'll be an absolute pleasure that we will have with us Jessica Cohen, the winner, the co-winner of International Book of Man Prize for A Man Walked Into a Bar, and she'll be talking actually about an unpublished translation of the 2019 Sapir Prize winner by Esther Pellet. Um, Patach Gado Le Melemata. Um, she'll be talking about her approach to translation. She'll be talking about her life as a translator and about her relationship with the Hebrew language. Um, once again, thank you very much, everybody. And as is customary, um, Aviva will now open the microphone to allow everyone a chance to say thank you directly to Professor Shen Chav. Thank you very much. Have a very good week. And I look forward to meeting with you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Akin. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Uh, Olga and everybody else, Viva, Benjamin. Thank you. Shukran. Shukran. Men Bechti.
انا مساء الخير اهلين اهلين تحكي عربي اه يا هلا شوية فيري جود ايفنينغ ايفريبادي شيرا كان سلام شيرا سلام Thank you, Akin. Thank you very much. Good night, Jacob. And goodbye, everyone. Good night. Good night.